Welcome everyone in our space and welcome who is joining us from outer space. You might be watching this later on. It might be because of your access needs. And we just want you to know that we are so happy you could connect with us. Feel free to, throughout the course of the session, after the fact even, write your comments on the stream, ask your questions. Um, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Every time is a new beginning for us to relearn and, and re-engage with what comes up for you um, as we have these conversations. And today we're talking about positive five-day scheduling and no more 10 out of 12s with three of my favorite human beings in this conversation um, who are actualizing it and manifesting it and helping us understand how that can be a reality. So um, in order to prepare the space for us to gather today, I would like to pass the ball to Adriana who will read our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we are coming to you from the land of the Leni Lenape people who historically territory, whose historical territory includes the places colonially known as Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Long Island, and the lower Hudson Valley. For more than 10,000 years, the Lenape people have been stewards of these lands, as well as the river of human beings or the Delaware River. Over the past 250 years, many of the Lenape people were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands and dispersed throughout the country, though some families remained. These families continue the traditions of their ancestors to this day. The violence that removed the Lenape from their homeland is a powerful part of the history of Pennsylvania, and we acknowledge that in this moment, and we work and live on these very lands. This is the story of our entire country. We encourage you to learn about the lands where you live and work, and the history of the people who lived there before colonization, many who still live there today. Though they are often starved of the very resources they protected for so long, including access to housing, sustainable food practices, safety, clean water, and the land where they once lived with their families. This information was provided in part by www.lenape-nation.org. Thank you so much, Adriana. We receive and acknowledge that um, the statements and realities. And now it is my pleasure to offer into this space our community agreements. Um, so this is something that we will all engage in together. We see you all as human participants, even as listeners. As a session participant, you commit with us to welcome all caregiving responsibilities and realities in the background or foreground of any meetups, phone calls, and exchanges, and embrace your life in our pursuit of productive and supportive practices. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating a transgender and non-binary affirming space all language that includes but is not limited to mother, parent, dad, caregiver, etc., applies to any individual who identifies with these terms. And as a session participant, you commit with PAL to creating spaces rooted in justice and anti-racism in our structures, practices, policies, principles, and producing. And as a session participant, you commit with us to creating safe and supportive spaces for disability access and inclusion and all access needs present in the space. And now I would also like to share the safety acknowledgement of our community and our communal responsibility as we gather digitally before we engage in our conversation. And we want everyone to know with this agreement that we prioritize safety over civility. That means that if at any point in this session you feel unsafe, please speak up for your own safety using your voice, the chat, or even private messaging myself or a colleague if that feels most supportive whether there's Zoom bombing or aggressions that may be seen as micro to the outside but are not micro to your experience, we will honor your experience and engage immediately. Your safety is more important than the flow of this conversation. So please absolutely prioritize yourself in that moment. And with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our guests to this conversation. Um, I will be doing brief introductions to um, honor the work that uh, has touched Pal's work and, and touched our lives. And then I invite them to also self-introduce after that before we get started. Um, my, as I do the introductions, I would like to invite everyone participating in this session to please drop into the chat why you're here. What came to mind when you saw the title of this session? What's on your heart when it comes to scheduling? Um, it can be even just one word like logistics, or it can be one word like 
crew, one phrase like crew payment, or it can be, I really need this in my life. Can you talk about how to frame this? Um, we invite all those questions. If you would like me to read your question anonymously, please share a direct message with me and I'm happy to be that voice in this space. So populate, populate that chat. Without further ado, I would like to first introduce Patricia McGregor, who is a director extraordinaire. We first met at the Yale School of Drama. Um, her accolades are aplenty, um, which we'll share later on in the space. Um, but uh, Patricia, as a director, has effectively executed five-day rehearsal days, she uh, rehearsal weeks. She has executed Tech Without 10 out of 12s and um, is a part of the PAL advisory board because of her fluency and understanding of this mission and this agenda as being part of um, labor equity and labor ethics and how we can all engage in a workplace that honors its artists and contributors. So Patricia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me and thank you for the work you do. No, oh, likewise. And um, next, Clint Ramos, who is a designer extraordinaire as well, um, who uh, congratulations on the opening of Slave Play recently, both you and Lindsay. Um, uh, the reopening, I should say. Um, Clint is also a part of the collective design action that is advocating for a more equitable anti-racist and, um, and humane spaces. Um, I believe it applies to all disciplines, but it is engaging with the um, lived experiences of designers in the work place. So Clint, thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you. And yes, I echo Patricia. Thank you for all the work that you've been doing in that end. Listen, we can only do this together. Pal's theme this year is communal change. There is no single person who can enter a space and change it. it enter the space and find your community and then change it together. Yes, Dan. Um, and then my absolute pleasure to introduce Lindsay Jones, um, designer extraordinaire himself as a sound designer. Um, probably doesn't want you to know or does want you to know used to be an actor um find his videos online and uh, <laughs> as some of the funniest facebook posts by the way but um in terms of professional credits also congratulations on the reopening of slave play on broadway and uh thank you for starting no more 10 out of 12s which is a national cohort that is directly engaging with um eliminating the 10 out of 12s as as practice in our tech weeks and encouraging folks to find productive ways to bring the five-day rehearsal week into reality into the regular standard um the the trajectory has been incredible um how this movement has grown in terms of its surveys its lists of theaters who are actively engaging at pal we always say we don't talk in hypotheticals or theories we talk in actuals um and no more 10 out of 12s we'll drop the website in the chat is gathering those actuals the theaters are putting into practice so lindsay thank you so much for being thank here you. thank you for having me and i also want to you know echo Clint and Patricia, that um, I, I'm so grateful for you. I feel like I learn so much every single time I'm in a room with you. So thank you for everything that you you bring to all of us. A pleasure. That's what these rooms are for. And I just want to invite everyone on the chat too. Um, we we release our facilitators from having all the answers. We also release you from having all the questions. Um, we are going to learn in this space. It's part of emergent strategy, right? That um, we're going to find the conversation in this room that only the folks in this room can have. Um, and thank you so much for our questions that are starting off. Um, I would like to start with uh, the with a few questions that I have for our speakers, but um, then we're going to dive in there. So just to start off with, um, Patricia, my question to introduce for you is, could you just share um, your early relationship with five day rehearsal week, 10 out of 12s, um, your connection to uh, your mother as an activist, which the ending time we can bring intergenerational realities in, I'm so excited about, and then where you are now with your understanding of, of what it is, just like your, your timeline with this practice. Sure. So I'm, I may root it in uh, my mom first, in that my mom was an art teacher. She was a painter and an art teacher and a union worker. And so many of my earliest memories are being like dressing up my sister and I performing on picket lines at our school for better practices. And, I, you know, early on, the maybe more around middle school, but the idea that the, the Fair Labor Standards Act happened in 1940, you know, Congress passed around middle this school. 40 hour the idea that the, oh, there's, there's a little echo. Did you all hear we that? I have someone joining who's on double Zooms. That's oh, okay. Interesting. That's all right. Um, uh, nice. Um, yeah. 
the idea that the like the 40 hour work week and even you know it was interesting to hear Andrew Yang even question like maybe we should be at the four four you know four days instead of five day anyhow all of those before I thought about it in terms of leadership best practices it just felt like well th this is the baseline that at least Congress has agreed to with a lot of work starting back in 1866 and I'm sure I'm before that right so like there has been an, a lot of people talk about, oh, this is so new. And I'm like, no, there's been an avalanche of people fighting for this and suffering against it for a long period of time. And that idea and the idea of collective action, you know, really is rooted in my mom's idea of what are best practices just across the board in education, in arts. So whenever she saw me in practices that were, you know, pushing against that, she would say, okay, well, it's a choice. It's a choice, but just know you all are making a choice. And I think that idea that we often inherit practices and we think mm. that's just the way it is, but really being able to call into action that it's a choice. Um, so I've always thought, well, uh, as a workaholic person as well, and as a person who's inherited a culture that is kind of, um, uh, you've got to prove yourself and we want to have, everybody wants to have the best work. Uh, it was really in grad school, I started to think about what are the parameters, we started to feel um, the fraying edges. I started to see people very frayed by what was not chosen, because I know sometimes you might choose to do something at midnight, you know, with a collective of people. And, you know, that feels like a slightly separate thing. But what is what is demanded hmm. of you to participate? What hours are demanded? What is, you know, to participate? And so uh, back then, we, I remember Nundami Sotembe and I, uh, her parents are arts leaders in South Africa. And she said, you all should start advocating. Why are you, you know, can you have five day school weeks instead of six day school weeks? What is the value? How do you, you know, what is the cost value analysis of this? And, uh, you know, um, tragically around the time where we were advocating for looking at best practices, we had a student um, who died in a load in that may have been completely, um, you know, it might have been a freak accident that had nothing to do with anything that we could prevent. And also it was at a time where we were not within a 40 hour work week. And he was a brilliant, you know, Pierre Salim, he was a very dear friend of mine. And I feel like that moment galvanized these things that I've been thinking about and I've been getting a lot of pushback on, but like this is, we have to work under best practices because um, the consequences can be grave um, emotionally, physically, you know, in every kind of way. So that really lit a fire under that for me. And I just think, you know, a lot of people say, I do think it helps if you're a caretaker. I think it helps if you're a lot of things, but I actually think it's just a better way to work. And I love somebody in their, in their notes said 10 out of 12s is a colloquialism for 14 out of 18s. There are many people who, for whom they are working 18 hours a day. We are trying to do work that illuminates humanity, that hopefully moves us towards a better better way of being and yet we work against that so often and i i have what i love about the work that you're doing and, and these collaborators here is i do feel like we're working more collectively because i've been in a lot of spaces where i've gotten such major resistance and such major call out like you know you're such a troublemaker for banging the pan on this what's so exciting to me is it feels like now there's a collective wave and this thing that felt like it was an outlier this idea of five day work weeks or no 10 out of 12s it feels like it's now centering in the conversation which is so exciting because then i think we get to collectively move that thing forward and it's not about an individual radical thought it's about this is the best practice and we just have to create the new way. And, and anyhow, there's a lot I could say about it, but that's, I hope I answered what you asked. Yes, and and more. Yes, and and more. Um, and I feel like the, the head nods I'm seeing and feeling in the activity in the chat is just um, evidence of that. Just, just to uplift some takeaways there, um, this idea of there has been an avalanche toward this for a very long time. And so, you know, the nervousness of that anyone would feel of like, oh, we'll have to invent ways of doing this. It's like, no, we just have to listen and research folks who have been doing this and, and be willing learners and be willing students of what a new way can be. And then this, this, um, this beautiful offering of we inherit our practices. That is like such a revolutionary recognition because then we realize the practices themselves aren't inherent. 
to the work, but that they've just been handed over and can you return a gift? Um, and, and so what you're talking about now at the end with this collective, um, it just really laid the foundation for me to realize, oh, wow, when we gather together as a group, we are creating a new inheritance for the generations coming in. The last sessions are talking a lot about students and how are we conditioning students? So yes, and yes, and to that. Um, jumping out from there, Clint, I'd love to hear you know, your relationship with the schedule and, and your timeline of either first inception of experience it, um, the source point for design action and, and how it's evolved to where you are now in your relationship. Hi, friends. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I'm also on Lenape land, um, uh, you know, acknowledging stolen land and also acknowledging the stolen people who built this land, uh, who built this country, I mean. Um, uh, I, my, it's funny, I just thought about like what I just said, you know, I think that, the, I think it is a legacy of capitalism and this mm. is the legacy of America, right? Like, I think there's no other sort of metaphor for America than the American theater. I think, you know, that's more effective in a way of like looking at it, right? Like the, the way we've contorted ourselves into convincing ourselves that these are actually, um, that these are noble, you know, that these practices are noble that it is a higher goal because for some reason we are actually doing something that is close to something divine. We are not, we are workers. And that's why I always want to say, you know, oh, we're artists, but I want to ground us in saying that we are actually workers. We are talking about labor practices. We are workers, right? My relationship to this schedule has always been um, like everybody's schedule. But I think for me, I come from an immigrant background. You know, I am I'm an immigrant to this country. And um, and particularly with uh, you know I, I'm from the Philippines and I know a lot of like Filipino immigrants here are <clears throat> the relationship to this country is work right and but in that like there's always an inculcated culture that all you need to do is really keep your head down and work don't complain keep your head down and work and you will get what you want right but i don't actually i think part of that has been cultural and then when i moved here right so i come into this country thinking this and like you know being inculcated this even in the motherland right which had been an american colony for a lot of, for a long time and then you come into this country and then i work for a lot of black folk who basically tell me no you got to work twice as hard right and and i and i believe that and because it is true right it is true and it is so all of this comes to it, it collides you know in this kind of um this feeling of like i i can't say anything about this i really can't this is just the culture this is if i want if i want to be part of this community of which i get a lot of satisfaction not only sort of like just work wise but a community you know, like I get to actually commune with people who think the same way as I do, who believe in the same politics as I do, or at least they do, they declare it, you know, and, and who actually are, um, uh, uh, who want to solve problems the way I want to solve problems, then that's the price I have to pay. Right. That, that, this is the price for community. And I think that's the thing that I that I think we have to slowly dismantle. Right. And I just have to say that I think, you know, thank God for Lindsay. Right. Because. Uh, and this is sort of a double edged sword. Right. Because uh, up until like white men were starting to say shit about this. We were just troublemakers. Just keeping it real. We were just troublemakers, right? Outliers, complaining, not grateful, ingrates, right? And so, you know, I come at this whole thing with a lot of rage, straight up, a, a lot of rage. And I am most effective when I disrupt, you know? Um, and so that's, to me, it really drove home the point, right? When, um, after uh, we see you had had written out the demands, and I had I was having a um, uh, a conversation with Rihanna Yazi, uh, uh, who runs New Native Theater, um, and 
she really hit that point of like, you know, yes, it is oppressive to everybody. Just consider the baseline oppression, which is already immense, right? But when you think about Native people, a people who are recovering from genocide, and you are asking them to literally participate in working conditions that do not promote family, then what are we actually doing? It is not benign. It's, it's not like, you know, oh, you can choose not to or do it, you know, because I, 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 see, I hear this rhetoric right now, right? I hear this whole rhetoric that's happening in theaters right now. Where it's like, well, you can choose the five-day work week or you can choose this. These are what institutions are doing right now. But I want to ask these institutions, are you actually considering the power dynamics of who's asking these questions? What are you going to do to these actors who want to succeed, to these designers who want to succeed, to these directors who want to succeed and just say, hey, choose. This is what we've always done, and this is what the institution knows best to do, or do you want to do the other way? What do you think they'll say? I wish I had a tambourine. I wish yeah. I had a tambourine. <laughs> I'm just saying, we've been saying yes. this for a long ass time. You know, it's just, it's too much. I mean, we can even get, a, okay, Linz, say something. Yeah, no, I, I yes, I will throw the ball to you, Lindsay. I just want to uplift. I just want to uplift because we don't have to do sharp cutoffs. Like, yes, yes, and. Um, Paul's opening session was on BIPOC leaders and a legacy of care because we have, we've been lied to about all our equity work the whole time when it comes to childcare funds aren't sustainable, you can't bring children into the space, et cetera, et cetera. We're like, oh no, white supremacy centered organizations don't know how to do it, but there are BIPOC leaders who have been doing it for decades, who have been doing it forever, who live as modeled examples, but that looks like an outlier and revolutionary because they're not centered. And I just want to honor that. Yeah, I, I keep on going back to what Nicole Hannah Jones, there was a great conversation that Nicole Hannah Jones and Tanahisi Coates were having, right? And it was really about like how, how we formed this country, right? Like how did we form this country and how did, and, and in that sort of the way we actually approach work, the way we actually approach sustenance and the way we, you know, the way it's been legislated, right? And for 12 straight presidencies, all of those presidents actually had, like were full-time slave owners. They weren't part-time moonlighting as slave owners. They were slave owners, right? And in that, in the formulation of all of these things, right, where, while, while they were, what allowed them to conjure up these ideals in their drawing rooms was the idea that some, they were being sustained by a labor force that was separated from them, right? And, and how, we, how are we different? How are we different in the American theater? Mm -hmm. when our leaders are actually on location. Whether that's in their offices or somebody, you know what I mean? Like, how are we different? Yes, and 100%. Um, and I also want to lift up your, um, your point. So important in all of these conversations, all of our equity con conversations about the power dynamic. Um, just this last fall to share like how, how it, plays out and for everyone on the call and everyone listening, if you are an individual seeking employment for you to identify it, and if you are a leader for you to eliminate it, but this idea of optional access is such a fallacy. Um, I had a conversation this last fall with someone when I was talking about lactation space, they said, oh no, we have a fantastic lactation space. And I said, well, how do people know? Uh, because part of access is being forward facing with your commitment to it. And um, I was offered that when people ask for it, they can receive it and we'll just know when someone is pregnant. And the way that that centers people who are safe enough in the space to, to even say they have an access need, we are putting the obligation, when you put the obligation on the person with the access need to ask for access, it is not equity. It might not even be legal in some points, but this idea of if you are the institution, we talk at Powell about identifying where you are on the power dynamic vertical and where you are on the discrimination horizontal axis. And the higher up you are and the further you are toward privilege, that's how much responsibility you have to create the access to self-educate, 
the further out, the further toward discrimination potential you are, and the lower you are in the power dynamic, you're the one with the greatest risk and fewer resources who should be approached more about all the assets and access that we have. So if you're going to do no more 10 out of 12, if you're going to do a five-day work week, then do it and commit to it and hold yourself accountable, not the people who have to seek employment from you. And on that, I'd love to throw the ball to Lindsay. <laughs> Talk to us. Tell, tell us about your 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 personal trajectory with this movement and this passion and where it started or how it formed and, and where you are now. So yes, I, I feel a lot of pressure to follow these two people who are just absolutely incredible. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I do think it's important for me to acknowledge that my journey on this is, is a learning journey and that I have definitely um, been navigating my own position in white supremacy and uh, privilege in terms of exploring the situation. Um, for me, I mean, to start off, um, I have spent many years working nonstop, you know, around the clock, uh, doing show after show after show. And um, the best that I felt that I could do was to just master this system that we are all in the system that is about um, putting the show's needs above all else. Um, and uh, that is a system that I was introduced to and I did my best to, to master that system as much, much as I could. Um, and really where uh, I began to become aware of it was at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, I noticed that um, all of my colleagues, designers like me, um, I'm, I work with an organization called Theatrical Sound Designers and Composers Association. Um, and I looked around and all of us, and we were all exhausted. Um, we were all um, overwhelmed. Many of us felt unhealthy um, physically and mentally. Um, and also I have many friends who are um, in design positions in the business They've had tremendous strain on their relationships. They've had tremendous strain on their um, their family building possibilities. Um, it's very stressful. And so I introduced the idea of like, what if we came up with a way to sort of discuss self-care for the designer um, that, that, of trying to figure out how we could do that. And really it became clear almost immediately that self-care is almost impossible in the current system of six day work weeks and 10 out of 12s, like you, you have no time for self-care. You have no ability physically to create that. Um, so that's sort of the impetus that really got us thinking about it. And then thankfully we see white America, uh, white American theater came out with their list of demands where they placed it as a priority and, uh, I, I look at those lists of demands as a tremendous gift to all of us um, for us to really stop and just stop and think and think carefully about what have we been doing? How can we do it better? Um, just, just from its basis form. Um, and as I began to explore this more and be inspired by that document, the coalition of no more 10 out of 12 started to sort of form from that. I have been so lucky to um, be in conversations with people like Clint and Patricia and others who have been gracious enough to, uh, to, get, to give us their labor in explaining uh, the positions of how it is um, exceptionally hard on BIPOC communities um, and how it is exceptionally hard uh, for caregiver communities and uh, parents, things like that. Uh, things that I have known as a parent myself in a tangential way, but to receive again and again, firsthand testimony and experience from those who have had a different path than me um, because I am, you know, a cisgendered white male at the end of the day. And my experience, I, I didn't know all these things. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to learn. And um, I just feel like it's my uh, 
my duty to to hear these voices, to respond and to to honor them, to honor their labor by trying to bring a more healthy and sustainable practice to our entire theater community so that we really can make lasting change for our entire community as a whole forever. I really think that's, we owe that to ourselves. We owe that to one another. And I, I really believe that we, we must all work together as a community um, to solve this. And, and I think we can, I think it's really going well and I'm, I'm really excited about where we are with this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's, that's my follow-up is, I love that you identified being on a learning journey. I think that a lot of folks on this call and maybe even folks watching the stream, that's okay to acknowledge for yourself too. You may not be at the point of like experience. You, you may be, you know, I have my own kindness to baby Rachel really misunderstood the assignments, a uh, story that I will share a confession where it's okay to be kind to yourself uh, that you did not know or do not know. But the question is, are you learning? What are you doing with the learning? And that's my question for you, Lindsay. I want to hear about no more 10 out of 12s. What have you done with your learning now? And what, where, where's the cohort and what is the cohort? Well, okay, so that part is really exciting. I mean, that that is the part I'm super, super excited about. Um, just to talk briefly about the journey of No More 10 Out of 12s, what happened was um, initially we began as a sort of a collective of designers, just as a starting place. We almost immediately reached out to stage managers. We found directors, uh, actors, producers, production managers. We wanted to try and find as many different uh, parts of the industry as we could to have everyone work together so that we could all have, um, you know, a, a sort of universal perspective of how these practices affect people within their individual job tracks inside of theater. Um, we then began um, collecting data and research. We invited several health and safety experts into our group who have been able to inform us with all sorts of information. Um, and then we created a website, which you can check out now. It's no more 10 out of 12s.com. Um, and there's all kinds of information on exactly the data of why 10 out of 12s and six day rehearsal weeks are harmful um, from a health perspective, from a safety perspective, from a uh, respect and uh, uh, you know, a fairness and equality perspective. Um, all of those things are really important. They're laid out there. And then from there, we started to collect people's individual experiences through our petition and through our, um, through our survey to try and understand people's things. And from there, we've begun to sort of branch out and say, okay, let's take all this stuff that we've learned. Let's share this with as many people as possible. Let's get this conversation started find a friend and sit down with them and say, I know you don't like having to do these 10 out of 12s. Here are some helpful reasons for you to understand why you don't like them, as opposed to just somehow you're lazy or you don't want to work hard because I've never met a single person working in theater who doesn't want to work hard. We all come to this, this life with a tremendous amount of passion and a tremendous amount of ambition. And we understand theater is not an easy thing to make a living in, you know, from its basis thing, but it doesn't, it does not have to be exploitative. Um, it does not have to be um, anti-family. It does not have to be uh, anti-BIPOC. Uh, it does not have to be anti-disabled. Uh, it doesn't, have, there's so many things it doesn't have to be. And by having these conversations, allowing people the ability to reflect on um, what these potential changes could mean. Um, it's been so exciting to just watch light bulb after light bulb after light bulb turn on for people who say, I can make a difference. I'm, I wanna start this. And so that has been our journey. And where we are right now is we have over 125 theatrical institutions who have made the commitment to either no more 10 out of 12s or, uh, and or uh, six day work weeks. We're continuing to add people to that list all the time. You can see that list on our um, solutions page of no more 10 out of 12s.com. Um, and we're continuing to push and we want to 
uh, be available as a resource for people to um, ask questions and try to understand how they can make these changes. Because I think the hardest part is saying yes. Everything after that is totally manageable. And, and we want to help people learn how to say yes. 100%. I absolutely agree. Perfect transition actually to the chat because y'all are sharing some great stuff here. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to throw the ball to you all and then I'll queue up the next question. Um, thank you from Rebecca. I'm here because, uh, San Francisco shakes has been actively humanizing rehearsal schedule since two, 2018, choosing a five day schedule and no 10 and 12 since two, 2020. I want to hear from others who are doing this and what best practices they've found, especially for directors, designers, stage managers, and others, since much of the focus has been on actors. And I'd, I'd love to refine that even further, Rebecca, if that's okay. Cause Lindsay, let's just dive in. Could you just like, uh, share briefly before we jump to the next question about, um, your thoughts on centering, crew and designers and folks who live in techs and, and, and how to, how to make sure that the practice of just eliminating 10 or 12 centers, the, the folks who need it. Absolutely. Um, so yes, as it has already been pointed out in the chat and, and thank you to those who have said that a 10 out of 12, essentially just to break it down is, uh, a requirement from actors equity association that is for actors and stage managers only that they work a maximum of 10 hours in a day out of a 12 hour span. Um, that is currently the only theater union that has any type of mandate on how long a worker can work in a day. So for example, in my union, United Scenic Artists, um, uh, I, I have no limit on how many hours I can work in a given work day or how many days in a row I can work. Um, the same is true for those in stage hands who are in IATSE. Um, and, and many other unions that are not actors equity, they all have no limits. So as a result, a 10 out of 12 day that we know the actors are working can frequently mean a 16 to 18 hour day for those who are working four hours before the actors arrive doing notes and frequently several hours after the actors leave at night, um, which is, a completely unsustainable way of living. You, you can't really do that for that long. Um, and I think Clint said this earlier, you know, we are not, we're, we're not any greater uh, humans. We're, we're mortals like everyone else. Um, we, we only have so much physical and mental reserves after which we become depleted too. Um, so by, by, Reducing 10 out of 12s to a lower number, what we're basically doing is taking those folks who work those 18 hour days and we're lessening those hours, hopefully by at least two hours. That's our start. In, an, in a perfect world, it, it could be less and there may be more ways to accept that, but we want to at least make a good faith first step to allow people to, um, to have a less of a longer day so that they can... Um, they can do their jobs and still have a life and have their health. Absolutely. Let's do a pendulum swing. Lindsay, I'm going to do a quick play with you. Um, and I'm going to be executive director, really excited about making change in my organization. And I'm going to come to you and um, I would like for you to, as a designer crew advocate, uh, ask for what you need. So um, I would like to say, okay, Lindsay, that's great. But then what do we do? Do we, what hours are you doing? doing six out of eight? Is that still for the actors or is that for the crew? I mean, does the crew come six out of eight and then the actors come three? I, and this just sounds like a lot of hours scheduled. Do you have a template or do you have a format, a, a best practice or other organizations that are doing it in a way that's structured that I can write down on paper in the numbers? So yes, the great news is I have a list of 125 theaters that have already started doing this. They're all available to you at any point. They're on our, we encourage you to contact those theaters because the truth is all theaters work differently from one another. It's, you know, it's challenging to sort of say like, well, this worked for this theater. So it'll just take their solution and paste it into yours. Um, every theater seems to have a different culture, have, seems to have a different corporate structure, um, but those ideas, they can be shared. And so hopefully by contacting theaters that are on our list and saying, how did you do this? You can gain ideas from that and make your own ideas. Um, no more 10 out of 12 doesn't necessarily have a specific template that we can hand to say, here's how you solve your problem, American theater. Um, and technically 
it's not really our responsibility to do that. We want you to own that solution. We, we want you, American theater, to make this your priority and make this your solution because we want you to invest in that solution. If we just hand it to you, there's no, there's no way to know for sure how seriously you're gonna take it. But if you really put the time and the thought and the effort to explore these things, and we've given you all the resources for you to do that, we believe you're gonna come up with not only the best solution for your organization, but the most long lasting and substantial solution. And yeah. it's also we're saying this should be an evolving idea. This is not like you make these changes and then you just walk away and you're all set. In theory, you will be, um, you'll be listening to your artists. You'll be listening to the workers around you and saying, how is this working for you? What adjustments do we need to make? And this will be an ongoing thing, which then hopefully might translate into other areas such as childcare and other things that I'm sure people in this room would be very glad to talk about as well. The idea of like, once you start listening to your workers to make it a more beneficial place to work, perhaps there are other changes you can make to make it a sustainable environment over the long term. That's my hope in the future. 100%. And uh, there's a director question, um, Patricia, that I'm going to throw to you in a hot minute, but um, just a, a huge yes and that the responsibility of self-education, anyone who wants like a quick template and answers, the answer is no. Um, do the research, invest in the work. Lindsay said, listen to your artists. And here's why that's going to feel scary and, and uh, not as professional or as structured is because exactly that of what we've been talking about all week as well. You start saying like, well, if we provide childcare and those access needs, we'll set a precedent that we have to do more. And we're saying, that's exactly the point. We're not saying here's your one sheet on how to eliminate 10 out of 12s and still come up with a show that people buy tickets for. We're saying, listen to your artists. Here are the resources you need to self-educate Prove yourself as a leader by how you invest in your immediate community first before you start talking about your donor community and your audience community. Um, thank you for that. So in the chat, um, Ashley shares, um, I throw this ball to you, uh, Patricia, as a director, thinking about how to advocate for the needs of my actors and creative team to producers. As a programming manager in a nonprofit, thinking about the toll that tech performance weeks take on our part-time staff and non-exempt full-time staff who might have to manage comp time. So Patricia, I know you've had these conversations with producers. So um, yeah, sharing, you know, kind of sharing what that dialogue is like. I feel like, um, A, I love that you put the matrix of like where you sit on the vertical and horizontal in terms of access and all that. And I think people now see me coming and they're like, uh, she's gonna ask for that five day work week. And at, in, the, in the rehearsal room, it's actually easier, A, because it's just the way I work. I feel, um, okay, a couple of things you can use to advocate. A, the labor does not end when you're in the room. Right. So everyone, my expectation is that or my knowledge is that people outside the room. So if you want to just count numbers, count the amount of hours it takes for an actor to learn their lines, count the amount of time it takes for a designer to build a thing, count the amount of like. So say you want to go by the numbers. There are so many numbers outside of the numbers in the room. So if you if you are dealing with somebody who has, you know, an abacus in front of them, move those beads around um, and you're going to find a different formula and maybe you'll respect that formula. Right. That's first of all. Second of all, this um, formula that we've received that Almost any play, maybe there's more time built in for a musical, but whether you have a one hour solo show or like a three act play, it is all generally expected to rehearse in the same amount of time and tech in the same amount of time. That is arbitrary. That is, that is it, so it's already a problematic formula because it's not being built based on the specific pieces. So let's already admit that it's like, it's flawed. It comes from capitalism. It's, you know, it's arbitrary. So in terms of how to advocate, um, a, acknowledging the amount of labor that happens outside of a room, outside of meetings. You know, I think that's one way. Um, B, and I really do, it's even recently, I feel I failed on, um, I came into room saying, you know, I do five day work weeks, I blah, 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 blah. And I didn't look at the schedule all the way down to tech. And even though I want five day work weeks, including tech week, there is so much more pushback, which is part of why I appreciate Lindsay and Clint and the work that you do with the knowledge that you have, because I can, I can control the parameters of my rehearsal room more easily. There are less voices. 
Whereas, you know, I've been really pushed very hard back on where they say, well, you don't, you know, we can't do it because of this. We can't do it because of that. You're not going to serve those groups. So I'd say making sure that those, the holistic conversations, because both are important to me, five day work weeks, 10 out of 12, making sure to like look rigorously at the calendar from toe to top um, feels really important. Um, and I do think this opt-in option is highly problematic. I think it will, uh, there is a, a uh, an elite club element of what we do. And that elite club element means that even in problematic, even in times where people are, are um, the hours are problematic, there are a lot of people who can buy their way out of some of the levels of discomfort, right? There are people who can have like full-time nannies and this person's going to do this and I can Uber that. And that just reinforces this culture of elitism which is also reinforces white supremacy, which also reinforces patriarchy. So I think if you really look at what are your core values, if you really value these things, you have to undo the system that you've inherited and you have to acknowledge the amount of labor. Thank you, Clint, for centering this idea in that we are workers. You have to acknowledge the work that is happening radically. And still, even as I advocate for these things, I still, I usually wake up at two in the morning from two to four, I do work. I started to just send the emails at two in the morning because I was like, I, I actually want you all to know that in order for me to do this work, I have to be up at two in the morning to make that thing happen. So it's okay that you see, you're actually seeing my labor, my outside of the traditional rehearsal room labor. So I think ways in which we acknowledge that um, and ways in which we really you know, and it's hard because I want to be, I, I, I want to be as gracious as I can. I want to be, but there are times where you say, you've got to take a hard look. And if you are calling that you value these things or don't, or don't pretend you value them. That's one of my conversations now, like, let's not pretend that you value them just like do something else. But if you're saying you're valuing them, these are some of the steps that you need to take. Um, and, uh, and I love that this whole conversation was is framed as centering humanity. And I think one of the things, um, cause our time is one of the ways in which we share how we value hum humanity. Mm. And even, even in rehearsal rooms, I tend to start rehearsal rooms uh, and even tech sometimes with everyone answering these questions, I am, I want, I need, I feel. And you sometimes feel, you know, producers or people being like, that's a waste of time. And I say, what, acknowledging everyone's humanity because we have to fight against this capitalist system that just wants us to produce, you know, without valuing each other's humanity. So like, like Lindsay said, we don't have all of the quick answer cheat sheets, but there are people who are doing it well. And I always say, find the people who are doing it in a way that inspires you, ask them how they did it and, mm -hmm. um, and pull yourself back when you get ruffled and think to yourself, what do I need to learn? Um, how can I be a part of this continuum? Yes, and yes, and what I love about that is um, we've so many of these sessions this week. It, the idea of communication as part of dismantling uh, structures that are oppressive has come up. The fact that we can acknowledge I'm in a learning place. I don't have it figured out and abandoning that perfection. Will you teach me? Um, is so important and necessary. Let's move forward, Clint. I saw you writing a few things down or um, having some thoughts. I just want to offer the space to you before I move to a question. Um, uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to build on what Patricia and Lindsay have been saying in those questions, actually. Or like, how do you advocate? How do you convince people? And that's always been sort of the dilemma, right? And particularly for, for people who operate on um, uh, uh, a different level of advocacy, because we all advocate differently, right? And, and for me, I think part of where I'm most effective, as I said, is disruption. And then how do you actually, you know, how do you, most of the time I get, I just get tone police, right? And, 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 and none of that go goes through. And so I found that I think for me, the best, uh, one of the best things was to really, um, go, you know, people love data. You know, they're like, <laughs> show me the data, <laughs> show me the data, show me the science, blah, 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 blah. And then so like for me, I think the, the, the biggest thing really is like, you know, going back to this idea of what this is about, which Patricia said, which is humanity, right? Like, and, and, and really looking at the fundamentals that of, of, of science, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, uh, <sighs> 
I remember Stephanie Ibarra, like, you know, she and I were talking about this and we were talking about like how like Octavia Butler and I know that you mentioned Edwin Marie Brown and other black futurists have actually said, but we have not seen the world that we are reaching for. Mm -hmm. We have not, we have not, we have not, we still have to actually find out what that world is. We have not experienced it. And I'm going to tell you why, right? Because this country and time immemorial, we have actually been functioning, uh, we have been, we have been operating on a very lessened and decreased cognitive performance level. And I say that because we have been functioning on a culture of scarcity. When I first listened to this whole scarcity thing, I thought it was like, are they talking about? Like, what, what exactly are you talking about? Right. Like, and, and it took me a long time. And I like, you know, like really digging into this. And um, it's scientifically proven. Right. It's just science. Right. That when you operate on this level where you are of want, on a daily basis, right? It's inculcated to your cell on a cellular level. Mm -hmm. Your cognitive performance is so lessened by almost like 40%, right? So when we talk about like these labor practices that promote a, um, a being where when you wake up, the thing that you think about immediately is I didn't get enough sleep, right? That's the number one thing. And then you go through your day thinking we don't have enough time, right? You end your day in your bed thinking about the tasks that you failed to do. Every single step of your day is about how you are actually failing, right? And this relates to like the studies that have been done on scarcity mindsets. Right. When, and, and, and when we can think about this in like any, any resource, right. And particularly what we're talking about, like, what we're talking about here is time. Right. But you can transpose this in any sort of resource. Right. And so when people in like countries where in developing countries where all they think about is, is not having enough. Right. Psychologists have tested these cultures and literally cultures where they actually have a glimmer of hope. Right, they have they they have figured out a way to kind of disrupt that thinking. Cognitive behavior, cognitive behavior actually rises, and this is proven. Like when Brazil, there was a point in Brazil's trajectory where they actually dismantled that, and almost overnight the economy went boom. Right, and it was because of leadership that it actually plummeted back again. So all I'm saying, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put this this uh, this you know uh, uh, this. Uh, the study in the chat, right? And so we have to really think about it scientifically, right? We have been functioning in this country on that level. But when we look at our resource, i.e. time, right? Rehearsal time, tech time, production time. When we really look at it as just time that we have as opposed to not enough time, we have not imagined how a fully functioning cognitive performance being actually could solve these problems, could actually create art in a way that we've never seen before. We've not imagined that, we've not experienced it because it is, it is, not, in our, it is not in our psyche. We actually don't know what that is. Can you imagine? Can you imagine just creating art fully 100% loaded? I can't, I cannot, it, it, that, that to me is profound. Yes. I, I just want to build on something that Clint is saying, which I think is so important and so inspiring, um, which is we're no longer talking about the theoretical anymore. We're, right. we're not talking about like if A plus B equals C, like it's it's not, we're talking about the the, the honest, truth of what's happening in this moment. If you look at what's currently taking place in the American theater right now, we are looking at a labor shortage. Um, it, it, it is a real thing where people left theater during the pandemic and they will not be returning. And in many cases, they left for better working conditions. I mean, it's as simple as that. And when now we are looking for labor in theater, particularly in the technical end of, of the field, um, it's a real struggle to find those people. They're, they're just not, they're not there as much as they used to be. And we, as a, 
we as a as an in working environment now have got to look at ways to be competitive. We have to look at how we can lure workers to our environment. We can't just take it that, hey, we're in show business and everybody wants to be in show business. So therefore we, don't, we never have to worry about taking care of people. We're, we're learning the hard lesson right now in this moment, which is that we must, we must do this for our survival as an, as an institution. This isn't just about like doing the right thing. Although God willing, I would love for everybody just to do things because it's the right thing. But let's say you're not interested in doing the right thing. Even if you're not, you still have to do this because otherwise it, it, down the road, we're going to be in trouble. We're, we're going to, you know, theater makers are going to, generations going to age out and there's not going to be another generation to replace them in the same way. And then you think you're going to have to make financial adjustments now, just wait. Uh, you'll find out how you're going to have to make adjustments in a really difficult and um, unfriendly way. And, and you have the opportunity now to work together as a, as a team. So take advantage of things like, like the, the, the article that Clint has posted is a, a fantastic article on um, really understanding why these changes have got to be made right now. Don't wait because we need this next generation of theater makers and we need to bring them in and rather than tell them that they either have to accept it or leave because they'll leave. And then yeah. we're, then where are we? I, I want to, I want to co-sign on what's been said. I also want to pause myself back and acknowledge that I'm on the Kumie land in um, San Diego. Um, I feel like often we rush forward and we miss the most important thing. So I will acknowledge that I rushed forward and missed the important, most important thing. So I want to start with that. I want to also call out that often this idea of equity and excellence are pitted against each other. And I want to put an example, and it, it makes sense in some ways why this example um, is here because of who was in the room. So I had an assistant director who came to see this production of Hamlet I did at the public, touring production. And he said, what happened? What was the drama? What was the like, what was the thing that made that thing so big, you know, good? That thing was good. What, what happened? Which is the inherited culture of like hazing and that something terrible had to have happened to make that right. At that time, Stephanie Ibarra was the head of um, the mobile unit. And Stephanie, and after a long time of, of, of working with Oscar and the, the things that Stephanie was advocating for and many people were advocating for, she just said, what do you need? I said, I'm gonna do five day work weeks. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And they said, great. The amount of love, I, I often say rigor and love, you know, that's how I wanna work is rigor and love. The show was excellent because equity was centered. Hmm. Yes, people were excellent. Chakwudi was excellent, all that. But we had such a joyful time and worked so hard and made this beautiful thing that was centered in all the best practices we could think of and continued best practices that we couldn't even think of. Like I see Garlia is, uh, you know, on this call. And I remember when I was working on the mobile this summer, she said, Patricia, you didn't, you know, we, we have care. We have child care. We have care, you know, to center it in some of this PAL stuff. I know I've inherited trauma about what so many people said, listen, you're a female director, like don't talk about having kids, don't talk about any of that stuff. And I've inherited, even as I advocate for all of these things, I've inherited this idea that it's my job or I had for a long time to just like suck it up, figure it out, you know, move things forward. And it's in these, I've found that in these spaces where best practices are really put in, the work can be excellent and sustainable, and a space, to Lindsay's point, where people want to be, and a space where more people are allowed to show up. And as a person, you know, I, 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 I appreciate Clint saying, thanks, Lindsay, for joining the, the, the team, because, you know, as a Black woman, I often get in front of a lot of these things, and you, you have to be dragging people with you. And I say, you've got so much more power. You know, I don't mind losing things. I don't mind people saying, you're not going to work here if you want to work in that way. And I've taken that hit. There are people who, who don't have to take that hit, who could get on the front lines of these things and create 
best practices and excellent work. So that's one of my biggest things is like, let's stop pitting excellence and equity against each other. And the more power you have, the more power you have in the room, the more on the front lines. I might, you know, next year I might take, I want my voice to be, you know, advocate, but I also want to like, recede from some of the front lines and have people who, you know, it's like, we, we've been doing a lot of the on-roading. If you believe in the thing, can you take the front lines of it? And it can lead to a more equitable, more excellent, and more sustainable into the future. Because a lot of new, you know, upcoming generations are like, no, we're not trying to have that flawed thing that you all just decided you could go through that hazing process. So anyhow, I just, I, I appreciate so much this idea of collective um, learning as well, because we all may be trying to move things forward in our lanes, but then it's, it's so uh, refreshing to be with people who've been thinking about these things. And I also hope that people who are listening to these things will be fed by it and then might also find themselves on the front lines more often, especially the more power you have in the game. Yes, and yes, and that's a real call to action. Folks may have come in here or joined to be like, I want my call to action to be my one sheet and my template, but no, the call to action is your advocates are tired. They're making your art better, making the space better. Your call to action is like, now it's time for you to step up and be better and do a better job using your privilege and your platform and your leadership to say yes to people when they tell you what they need in order to make that art that you say you're begging them to make in your space. I also want to uplift that phrase. Um, that you shared, Patricia, that um, excellence and equity are often pitted against each other. That is such an important anchor point in framing this whole conversation, because I think that's part of the shame surrounding it and part of the guilt surrounding it and ask, asking for what you need, because we've been conditioned to feel if I ask for childcare, if I ask for five day rehearsal weeks, if I ask for, can I take my kid to the doctor, they might've been exposed to COVID, if I ask for these things, I'm going to be seen as difficult. It increases exponentially depending on the intersections of your reality and discrimination. And you will be seen as less of an artist, less of a contributor. You will be making the play not as good. You will be making the work not as good. And the audacity of that lie, that myth, that if you do not and earlier today, Tamani Garza, she's our National Director of Community and Justice Initiatives, shared the phrase that institutions cannot continue just making a sacrifice at the altar of performative change or performative justice. Because the collateral damage is real talent. It's real people. It's real art. And I just want to continue to drive on this idea. Thank you, Clint, that you introduced in the space of imagine the work we could make with sleep, with food, with coming into the room saying, what do you need? Instead of where have you been? That entitlement is not gonna bring anyone's best forward. Um, Clint, feel free to jump in. I also have some questions we can try to get to um, in the chats. Thank you all again for being so engaged here. Um, yes. Um, this is a question from Facebook. Um, I love all my design opportunities, but logistics, and this kind of harkens a bit. Um, I'll, I'll do a comment and then pass on to anyone who wants to answer, but I love all my design opportunities, but logistics, too much work, needing it all to make a living. I'm a freelance designer, adjunct professor, working at multiple schools and community theater, not enough time to see my kids. I would love a 40 hour week job with reasonable hours, still making a living and grow my career, but how? Um, and I just want to offer that, like, so much of this is centered around this uh, idea of, um, of this reality of exhaustion that you introduced in space too, uh, Patricia, of, yeah, how can we all gather together for, let's say, this one comment on Facebook? If all of us became advocates together, we wouldn't exhaust our advocates who are making change, and we wouldn't lose the people who are asking this question on Facebook. So, yeah, what is your response when someone comes to you and says, I, in this present moment, in this time of change, I want to make a living and grow my career, but how? What is the offering that we can make to these folks? It's hard, right? Like, I mean, because you want to be able to just say, oh, hey, I, I know exactly how to fix this. Um, I, and it, I think it's going to require a combination 
of hard choices. It's going to be hard choices for the people who make these institutions, uh, who are, are, are run these institutions about creating uh, a more healthy work environment, a more sustainable work environment. But it's also, this is the hard part. It's going to require some discipline on us too. And that that's tough. And I, I think that's one of the things that we've tried to do in No More 10 Out of 12s is this is not an us versus them problem. This is not one group of people have this and another group of people have don't have that. There is elements of that. But the reality is, is by changing our schedule, it does mean that we'll be committed longer to a show. It means that we might have to, we, we will work less hours in the day. And if you are paid hourly, then you will be paid uh, differently as a result of that. Um, the theory is, is that we're reallocating these hours. So the same hours you would have worked within a certain number of days, you will work in a longer number of days to make it sustainable. But you may have to make choices. And when people say, but I might, I might make slightly less money if I do it that way. Um, it's possible. It, it's not entirely, it's not a foregone conclusion, but that could be a thing that happens. And I want to say to those people, we're making these decisions as a community because we are prioritizing other things than simply capitalism. We are prioritizing our health. We are prioritizing our family. We are prioritizing the future. Um, and so I, I want to be clear with everybody who hears this argument. All of us will need to compromise the way we have done our business in order for true change to happen. We can't just say, oh, okay, other people will make this change and then I, we're good to go. Um, all of us are going to have to transform in some way and become more aware and become, uh, you know, understand that these working conditions take into account more than just money. Um, and that's a difficult thing to, to get your head around, but once you do, you'll understand that these are the things we have to do to move forward. I'll also say some of the work that art equity is doing is interesting to line up. And one of the things that art equity does, and this is like bridging to political, you know, how do we ad how do we advocate for national support as well? Art equity has, to Clint's point, gathered some of that data, you know, and presented it and said, this is why you know, senators and governors and Congress people, you know, all kinds of people should be advocating for the arts and allocating more public funding for the arts because arts actually an investment in the arts exponentially grows our economy. So for those who are, uh, you know, I always say this is why I'm doing it, but I know not everyone is built that way. <laughs> so if you want to make the case in this financial way, look at some of the art equity work and help to advocate. I also have to say, I was sustained, there was a Van Leer Fellowship at Second Stage, which for two years paid me $700 a month and then $1,000 a month. And I am here now partly because that sustained me. That was an outside thing, but the organization supported it. So I say for these organizations, because I feel like we are often as individuals um, trying to figure these things out. And I feel like now is the time more and more that organizations and institutions need, and, and people with the most power need to be really working hard to figure those things out. I think the, the distribution of wealth and whether that's, uh, if we're not growing the wealth that comes in, I think our equity is helping to try to grow the wealth that's coming in. We've got to look at how these things are distributed. So whether that's like, if we only have this in, in the pie, what are some of those, what are some of the um, budgets of a, a, how do we value the labor versus just the product? How do we, and that is also, let's be clear, some of these folks, artistic directors, executive directors are making 500,000, a million dollars a year. If we are looking at the whole pie, I think everything from how we distribute, you know, what's gonna be on the stage to how we pay each hourly labor to like, what are the people at the top making? And, and how we examine all of that so that we can say, how do we want to divide this pie in the most equitable way? 
And, uh, and that, you know, my husband always says the budget is a moral document. The numbers don't lie in terms of what you are valuing. And if I look at your budget, I don't need to hear what you say. You are speaking to me very loudly. And I think that awareness is becoming more and more transparent. So I'm like, get it together, people. Absolutely. And, and we just encourage folks, if you if you feel safe in a space, please know that you never it's never had to be a hill that you die on. You do not have to visibly parent or visibly care or visibly advocate if it puts you yourself at, at risk. Um, please know that you have the right to, to, to care for yourself. Um, but if in this space you're at a point where you cannot continue on that professional path with that organization, we're encouraging folks to say, hey, in order to continue this, um, I need more support because I love contributing here. Uh, what's your caregiver support plan? And we have to keep flipping the script instead of, hey, I've got all these ideas of how you can help me make your organization better. Remember that you're adding value to them by your existence, by your contribution. So say, what is your caregiver support plan? Or um, how are you engaging with supportive scheduling in this next quarter? Um, because I know that I, I, have, I have more ways to contribute, but right now your scheduling is prohibitive. Your scheduling not my access needs are making my work prohibitive. Your scheduling is making my work prohibitive. The responsibility is on the organization, bringing about that power dynamic. Um, yes, thank you to both of you. Um, a couple of shout outs in, in the chat. Um, apologies for the mispronunciation and, and Clint is welcome to correct me, but a shout out from Regina. Yes, Kababayan, Pinksy Pride there. Um, thank you for representing that, Regina. Um, and then, uh, we have some folks here. I think there's a solidarity here about labor and hours between artists and freelancers and those are working full-time arts admin and positions with producing institutions, disrupting and creating our expectations around scheduling for all of us, really leaning into how we need each other and how we can work to our collective liberation. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, just a lot of uh, affirmation that when folks have felt more supported in their organizations, they felt that their work was, was much better. Um, and then there will always be a financial component to this. You're going to have to buy two weeks or more tech to your show and pay your artists enough not to have to work two other jobs in order to be in your space for that longer time. So the money has to come from somewhere either way. We just had a budgeting session and a fundraising session here at PAL. And when we're honest, the, the budget is arbitrary and there's a lot of guesswork that goes into it. So what values are you guessing through? And then when it comes to fundraising, you, you fill the largeness of the glass that you create. How can you use access needs? Um, it was beautiful, Jenna shared. Use, um, engage in access needs. You have to believe it yourself, but engage in your donation and fundraising as capacity building, drawing more people in to support the work of your artists and talking about centering humanity, even the values of how you fundraise. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, we just have a few more minutes, but Clint, I, I felt like I saw you writing a few things down and I wanna offer the space to you um, for any thoughts on your mind now. No, I just wanted to, I can't, I can't take that. Uh, whoever asked that question, uh, you know, I think she was, uh, or they were a designer. Um, yeah about that litany of things that they had to do. And then the last part of that question is, but how, right? And I just keep on thinking about, uh, I, I try to, what I'm hearing is, uh, uh, is, is a questioning that, that, that really comes from a place of exhaustion, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I, I, I think part of, and, and I wanna say, I, I understand exactly where you are and I actually really understand what it is, right? And I wanna say that, that that question always lingers is like, but how, how, how? And I don't, th and th this goes back to my, my point about this mindset, right? Like we've not actually, we do not have the cognitive capacity yet to answer that question mm -hmm. because it's impossible right now, right? And so to me, I think that the challenge becomes, and it's always on us, right? Like, how do you imagine, this is our job, right? To imagine, like, how do we imagine a, a, a path forward, right? And how do we actually imagine um, uh, dismantling what we always say is unrealistic, as impossible? What are you going to do to make it possible, right? And I know you're tired right now, and, and I, I, I I'm going to share with you what I've done. I've actually taken a, a, a lot of stuff out. 
I've, I've, I've actually, and yes, I am losing that income. Yes, I am losing this. Yes, I am losing that. But here's what I've, I've noticed, in, and, and I'm hoping that this is true, right? Like this, that I'm just not like on this, like you know, uh, on this uh, uh, trajectory to, to, to something that's like not true. But, but, but I, I've noticed that I actually am able to imagine ways to. How do I say this? I've realized that in letting go of a lot of things, I've also let go of the things I thought I needed. And I am, so it, the, the, the amount of things that I want and I thought I needed is, is, uh, 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 ha has, uh, has lessened and it's almost a direct proportion kind of like um, relationship, right? And I, I, I and I know this sounds like really hokey, right? Like how I have kids, I have to be an adjunct at this and I have to be a, uh, all of that, right? But that to me means that the way you're, the, the capacity you have to imagine your future is actually very low because everyone else is taking it away from you. Mm. I don't know what the specifics are. I don't know what, and I am not offering this as a solution, right? But like, this is where I am in my life. I'm, I'm getting rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I have to say no to a lot of stuff because I want to, you know, th th there are things that I want to have capacity to imagine. I want to imagine how to be a better dad. I don't even know what that is, you know? Uh, I, I want to imagine you know, functioning and being uh, a good person, you know, uh, 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 to my husband, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, uh, I, I, I want to imagine that. I want to imagine things that even my parents didn't imagine, you know, and, and so I, I get it. I, I get it. Like I, I you know, I, I buck up against the way we're educating theater artist right now. Like I, you know, I've had a big sort of philosophical shift about that, right? Because right now, basically we're charging like $80,000 a year in undergrad for theater education. And how are those students actually, at, how are they not asking? When we say, oh, I, I'm, I, I you know, I, 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 I hate that you're like, that you're questioning me about that monetary value versus education, but what are their choices? They're paying 80 grand a year. Of course they're going to ask me. And I'm going to be like and my initial impulse is like I'm not a I'm not a customer service representative. But of course they're going to ask that. We're charging that money. Institutions are charging that money. I mean I, like I, that's the same with MFAs. Like what are we what are we doing? What are we doing? To piggyback on what Clint is saying, I feel like there's the personal look at how I'm engaging, what I value, and the, I've recently been, we haven't brought boards into this conversation, and I feel like in many ways, all the way up to like the people who have the final say about what is approved, not just for a moment, but sustainably, are often those boards. And I'm excited about where are the places that are putting the, the visionaries on those boards so that everyone from the student that you're talking about, Clint, who's wrestling with how do I deal with this, to you know the mid-career artist, to, they are being supported by people with vision all the way up to the boards. There is a radical nature of like, I feel like we are always trying to, you know, from day one, trying to figure out how we make this passionate thing that we're about. How do we make it work? How do we sustain? What do we hold on to? What we let go of? And I put, I love um, Clint that this, you've awoken in me this idea of like, yeah, what am I valuing? What am I letting go of in this point in my career, which is easier to do than it was 20 years ago. And I'm also looking to those people who are in those positions and saying, how do we get board members on? What do we value in those board members who will help make this work work and who understand that the value of time, when I do that, I am, I want, I need, I feel, 
50% of the people say, I need time, which to me says that that is the biggest commodity in addition to finances, which allow us to, you know, make everything work. But I'm really interested in how do we, how do we radicalize the, the onboarding and the valuing of people who will make it easier for us to answer these questions for ourselves and for each other. And I feel like I want to ring that bell of that challenge to those folks as well. Because the first ask is who has money? Who can we approach who has money? Right. And that to me is always weird. <laughs> you know, and we're like, oh, we're about community. We're having an institution that's going to do this cultural transformation. But are you asking your like your first ask should be when you try to attract board members is like, whose morals do we actually feel important? Who might have some money? It's, and you might have some skills. But also, like, it, it goes back to all of this idea, right? Like, there, there's this Washington Post article of, like, who actually gives more money. Black folk actually give more money than white folk. But here's the thing. Black folk give more money to institutions that promote community and faith. If that tells us something, <laughs> We're always like, oh, theater is about community, but why have we not? <laughs> why, why don't people believe that and give that, right? When your first asks are to these big sort of like conglomerates whose values are actually transparent to us. So you can build another theater? Like, you know, like what, what is it? If the people in leadership thrive on transactional relationship, the community within that theater and the product in that theater will be founded on transactional relationship. There's the formula. It's not an hours rehearsal formula. That's the formula. I think you all broke something up in there. Um, that is gonna be sticking with me for a long time. Boards came up this morning too and came up yesterday. And I just, also want to use this as an invitation if you're in leadership and you're resisting this idea of eliminating 10 out of 12s and resisting this idea of a five-day rehearsal week, please check in with yourself. Are you feeling the pressure of a system that goes even above your head and the pressure of people you have to answer to who are present in your space because of their financial contribution and not because of their support under you to improve your access and your community? I know you don't have the power to change all of that right now, but if you can at least check in with yourself and relieve yourself of that stress and pressure to perform for them, you might be hearing solutions better if you can let go of that. And just a huge yes and who are we inviting to our board? That's a question that keeps coming up and thank you for that, Patricia. Are we inviting folks into our board who want to see this radical access happen? Because folks are gonna give we're gonna attract folks who make donations, who believe in our work, if the work we do is something worth believing in as well. Um, plus one, second, all of that, we're so ready for change, but we need voices who center social justice, caregiving, humane practices and leadership. We need that. Or it's been discussed so, so much in the summit. Yeah, 100%. We're at time, so I wanna respect everyone's day and time. Um, and I wanna first say a huge thank you to these panelists for your hearts and souls in, in checking with yourselves and the way that you take care of others. Um, centering humanity at the Pal Summit is about caregiving, is parenting, elder care, other care, but also community care. How do we take care of ourselves and others? And this conversation brought so much soul to that. Um, oh yeah, anecdotally what I'm hearing with AEA producers is sure we'll do a five day work weeks if we can do all the allotted hours for the week on those five days. So. You don't need them. You don't need them. Take those hours and put research in the field and like say that they're on the schedule for folks to take on their own independent study. And showering might be an independent study because we're all dealing with the human experience and our own care is part of the research for this work. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. Um, just so going back to saying thank you. Yes, and I feel so fulfilled by the work that you all are doing. Um, so hopeful about what's coming up. Thank you to everyone who engaged with us in the session, on the chat, for everyone watching online, 
for everyone, whether you have been an advocate for decades, if you're feeling tired, thank you for all the work that you're doing that maybe we don't know about and, no, and you feel nobody sees. I just want to call that into visibility um, and say thank you if you haven't been told thank you today. Um, thank you to everyone who's in a learning place and who's here um, ready to learn. What are you doing with that learning? Um, and with that gratitude, I would love to send us on our way and invite Adriana into the space to close us out. Just thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, and to everyone who uh, spoke this uh, this morning, as well as everyone who has been chatting away on Facebook. This probably has been the session that has had uh, so many comments uh, on, on everything that you've all talked about. And for those who are watching also on HowlRound, thank you so much. Um, we are going to take a small break between sessions. Uh, the next session will be our closing session for the summit. Uh, this has been an exciting three days. Um, and as Rachel said, we are all grateful that all of you have, have been here. So I welcome you to uh, take, um, take yourselves off camera if you wish, take a small break, go stretch out, have, have a drink of water, and uh, we will be back in, in a short time. Thank you so much. And I just want to shout out, uh, please go to www.designaction.com to see the work that they've been doing that's important to designers and check out their five principles. Thank you so much, Clint. Um, we will be sending all the links mentioned in the session today to all participants and be sharing on social media um, this week. Thank you all.